Um, as you may know, we hold a monthly webinar series, and it's a way of supporting our best practice champions and their work in implementation. Uh, our speakers are those who are actively involved in guideline implementation, and today is no exception. Uh, today we're going to be focusing on facilitators and barriers to BPG implementation at an organizational and staff level using the example today of a public health unit. Um, as you may be aware, um, we utilize the toolkit as a resource uh, that focuses on the knowledge to action framework. And one of those uh, steps involves post-implementation is on evaluation. And we'll look at really how effective are the implementation strategies that we're using as far as for our organization, for us as providers, um, as well as for those um, that we care for. It tells us whether or not we're doing the right things right. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today. So before we get started, just a few housekeeping items to keep in mind. Um, we do want for our webinars to be interactive and engaging. And certainly if you have any questions for our speakers today after their presentation, we encourage you to type those into the chat box. Again, please use the All Participants option, um, and that way then we're able to see the questions as are all of our uh, participants. Um, and we'll first then have the presentation, and then we'll have our Q&A session afterwards. Um, we should have sufficient time to do both of those, but in the event that we run out of time, uh, then we can address those questions to you via email. Uh, we do like to record our presentation, so you will see the record button is on that. And that's a way then that we can archive these presentations so that those not able to attend today are able to listen to this at a future time. So I'm going to introduce our two speakers and let you know a little bit of what they're going to be speaking about and then hand it over to them. So joined today by Sarah Ellis and Lindsay McDermott. Sarah is a registered nurse and she is the public health manager at Graber's Health Unit and she is responsible for overseeing the Best Practice Spotlight organization, um, those activities as well as the Vaccine Preventable Diseases program. Uh, Sarah received her undergraduate nursing degree from McMaster University and has a master's degree in education specializing in curriculum teaching and learning from the University of Toronto. She's joined today also by her colleague, Lindsay McDermott, and she is a program evaluator with Weber's Health Unit. Uh, she's worked at Graybull since 2008, and in this role, she provides leadership in program planning and evaluation to all health unit programs and services. Lindsay holds a Master's of Public Health from the University of Alberta and a Bachelor of Health Sciences from the University of Western Ontario. Um, today, both Lindsay and Sarah are going to talk about the evaluation that the health unit has done at Great Bruce, um, and they wanted to look at um, the extent to which the BPSO initiative at the health unit was implemented as intended and whether it achieved specific outcomes. As part of the evaluation, BPG champions, committee members, and lead managers were interviewed or surveyed to assess key output and outcomes. The interviews and surveys revealed several facilitators and barriers to BPG implementation at both the organizational and staff level, and results of this evaluation are going to be shared as the recommendations for all organizations involved in BPG implementation. So I think you'll find this an interesting hour, and again, we thank Sarah and Lindsay for joining us today. So I'll now turn things over to Sarah and Lindsay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Hopefully everybody can uh, hear us. It's uh, great to be with everybody today. Um, so we'll get started. The objectives of our uh, webinar are to um, help participants gain an understanding of the facilitators and barriers to best practice guideline implementation at both the organizational and staff level, as well as to provide recommendations for how to support uh, BPG implementation process in your own organization. As Catherine mentioned, there will be some time at the end of our formal presentation for some collective learning from our shared experiences with BPG implementation and BPG um, journey. To begin with, we thought we would describe our health unit. Um, we are located on Georgian Bay. We're one of 36 health units in Ontario. Public health units, for those of you who are unfamiliar with them, are funded by the Ministry of Long-Term Care and local municipalities. They offer programs such as immunization, home visiting, dental, 
speech and language, sexual health, restaurant inspections, and clean water monitoring. We employ a variety of health disciplines, including nurses, um, dental educators, public health inspectors, speech language pathologists, epidemiologists, program evaluators, and dietitians. In 2004, or 2011, um, Great Bruce Health Unit applied to become a BTSO organization. And at that time, we were embarking on our first experience with accreditation, and we were looking strategically at learning how to incorporate more best and promising evidence-based practices into our work. And BPSO came along at a time when the organization was in a state of readiness for change. So as I mentioned, um, we began our work towards becoming a BPSO officially in uh, 2012 and received our designation in May 2015. Uh, we implemented five best practices as for the BPSO standards. They were breastfeeding, client center care, primary prevention strategies for childhood obesity, prevention of falls and fall injuries in the older adult, and interventions for postpartum depression. Um, we had designated one staff best practice champion per BPG. For the purposes of this presentation, these will be referred to as lead champions. Each lead champion then formed an interdisciplinary um, committee within the health unit to assist with implementation. Um, four of the five BPGs had formal interdisciplinary committees that met regularly throughout the three-year BPSO candidacy period, and one had a group of staff that supported the implementation of the BPG on a more informal basis. Committees were interdisciplinary and made up of RNs, public health inspectors, health promoters, dietitians, and PSWs. For the purpose of this presentation, the BPG Implementation Committee members will be referred to as BPG Champions. The BPSO Steering Committee was made up of the five lead champions, five managers which supported the lead champions, the chief nursing officer, an epidemiologist, and a program assistant. They met monthly to discuss implementation strategies, successes, and challenges. To kick off our journey, as a BPSO, we hosted a Best Practice Champions workshop through RNAO funding, and many staff, both from internally at Gregory's Health Unit, as well as a number of community partners from other sectors of healthcare, attended the workshop. As you can see, these are the pictorials we will be using as we move through the presentation to depict the lead champions, the supporting managers, the staff champions, and the steering committee. I will hand um, the presentation over to Lindsay now to discuss the methodology and results. Hi hey everyone, it's Lindsay here. So, as I'm sure you all know, there's an evaluation component for each of the BPGs, but in addition to that, um, we decided to undertake an evaluation of the BPSO initiative as a whole. And this was done in order to assess um, the key output and outcome measures that were based on the logic model that we would have submitted in our original proposal and to gather feedback on the experience. So you'll see on the slide there were three main methods to our evaluation. There were interviews with the lead champions, a survey of the BPG staff champions, and interviews with each of the supporting managers. So in March of 2015, each of the lead champions participated in a one-hour semi-structured interview, and the interviews looked at their perception of support for BPG implementation, their own leadership development, their perception of staff awareness and understanding of the BPGs, and the importance of evidence-informed practice, and we also gave them the opportunity to give us some recommendations and lessons learned, and we were lucky to have a 100% response rate from the lead champions in those interviews. Around the same time, we did a survey with um, health unit staff who supported BPG implementation through membership on a committee or who contributed other types of support. So there were 31 support staff and um, we had 84% of them respond to the survey, which was great. 
um, and also lucky to have proportionate representation from respondents from each of the BPG's committee, BPG committees. The survey looked at their perception of support for BPG implementation, the characteristics and behaviors of the lead champions that they felt facilitated implementation of the BPGs, and their perception of their own impact on BPG implementation. They also gave us some lessons learned for creating an evidence-based culture. In June of 2015, which was post our BPSO designation, we also did interviews with the five supporting managers, and they were the ones who um, assisted in supporting the lead champions throughout implementation. They participated in a 45-minute semi-structured interview and looked at their perception of support for BPG implementation again, sustainability, and recommendations for other organizations and supporting managers. And again, we had 100% response rate from those supporting managers. I should also note that in both sets of interviews, uh, participants were given the opportunity to review a draft of the final report to ensure both accuracy of the summarized comments and quotes um, but also, because there were a small number of individuals who participated in the interviews, they were also given the opportunity to request that any quotes not be shared in the report in order to protect their privacy and confidentiality. So today, Sarah and I are going to take you through some of the results of those interviews and surveys. So we'll start with the lead champion. So as Sarah mentioned, um, there were lead champions designated for each of the five EPGs. Um, and over the course of our BPSO journey, three of the champions remained constant. So some of you have probably experienced this flux and change just to the nature of the work environment. We had one who left on maternity leave and was replaced, and another unexpectedly um, where we had a new person join on. So there was a, a little bit of flexibility there. So, one of the most um, important facilitators that was identified by the champions was training. All of our champions attended the Best Practice Champions Workshop Level 1, um, but not every champion participated in the same additional training or learning opportunities throughout, or did they participate at them in the same time during the process. So, for two of the lead champions, um, the Summer Institute was the only training they received, um, and two others had the opportunity to do an advanced clinical practice fellowship in addition to the Summer Institute training. And then there was other um, training and learning opportunities that they participated in, and these knowledge exchange workshops would be an example of one of those. So all four of the league champions who participated in the uh, Summer Institute training later in the process agreed that the training was excellent, but felt that it would have been more helpful if they had completed it prior to starting BPG implementation. And you can see that from some of the quotes on the screen there. The, the words in italic are the quotes that came from the participants. Um, another lead champion felt that given the time commitment of the Summer Institute training, um, it would have been good to have um, the staff make a commitment in their work assignment to remain or become a champion on a BPG committee. It was felt that this would be beneficial for the organization to ensure that all of the training participants outline a detailed plan on how the knowledge they gain will support their professional uh, development objectives related to best practice. There are a few other um, training or learning opportunities that were considered helpful to implementation. One of them was uh, library training, so doing things like searching academic journals. Uh, the National Collaborating Center for Tools and Methods Online offers an introduction to evidence-informed practice that they found to be helpful, um, training related to inquire indicators, and also training related to planning for sustainability of BPG implementation. So, Sarah mentioned again that there were managers who were chosen to act as support for BPG implementation based on their role as a nurse and their current workload responsibilities. So this having the supporting manager uh, was highlighted as a really important factor by all of the lead champions and came up many times throughout the interviews. Almost all of the champions identified this as being the single most important factor in facilitating implementation of their BPG. They especially emphasized 
the importance of the manager in navigating interactions between implementing the BPG and higher level organizational decision making. Um, and this is especially helpful when it came to things like affecting policy change in the organization. Another factor that was noted by the lead champions as being important was the existence of that BPG implementation committee that Sarah mentioned. So each of the lead champions formed this interdisciplinary committee to help them with rolling out the BPG in the organization. And the committees were a little bit different in terms of the types of support that they provided. So there were some who acted in more of an advisory um, role and others took more of a hands-on approach to help carrying out activities and tasks. But regardless of their role overall, the champions felt that these committees were instrumental in the implementation process. And the fact that the committees were interdisciplinary was also really interesting for us. Um, in our organization, it was neat to hear even the non-nursing disciplines sort of talking the lingo of BPG. So you'd hear even our health inspectors talking about client-centered care, which is really great to hear. Um, the lead champions pointed out that the committees allowed different perspectives um, from both different programs and different work disciplines to be brought forward um, for consideration when implementing the BPG. So obviously in any case, in addition to facilitators, there's always some barriers that there are to overcome. So in the interviews, we asked lead champions if there were any types of support that they felt were lacking or missing. And interestingly, almost all of the lead champions felt that they missed having an opportunity to meet together as a group without uh, the managers, director, and other members of the steering committee present. Um, they commented that the steering committee felt sometimes like it was more focused on reporting, whereas if they had the opportunity to meet separately in a more informal setting, there may have been more comfort with um, focusing on sharing ideas and troubleshooting issues related to BPG implementation. Some other barriers that were noted included lack of time, oops, which is the slide here, lack of time, which is probably no surprise to most of you. Um, and another one was the lack of a clearly defined role for the supporting manager. So the lead champions seem to perceive the role of the manager differently. So some felt that the manager was there as a co-lead for the project, and others felt that the manager was more of a member of the interdisciplinary committee or somebody who was there to encourage them and create opportunities. Um, it was suggested by the lead champions that in the future it would be helpful to more clearly define this role for the managers for each of the BPGs. And this is a sentiment that was echoed um, in the feedback from the managers, and you'll hear a little bit more about that when Sarah um, shares the feedback from the managers. All five of the lead champions agreed that they would recommend the BPG lead champion role to another staff member, so that was great to hear. Um, and in doing that, they said they'd offer the following pieces of advice to anybody taking on that role. So forming that interdisciplinary committee for BPG implementation and finding a supporting BPG manager. Um, engaging and motivating other staff to be involved because it helps to encourage their ownership of the project and obviously helps them to disseminate information across the organization. Um, sitting down with a planner or evaluator right at the beginning of the project to help develop that plan and keep you on track. Having a good understanding of the timelines and the commitment involved so you know whether or not it's going to fit into your work assignment for the next three years. Um, if it's possible to get some experience sitting on an existing BPG committee in the organization, that can be helpful before taking on the role of lead champion. And also that recommendation to do the Summer Institute training as early as possible before starting BPG implementation. There were a few suggestions of things that lead champions would change or do differently if they had the opportunity to participate again. So they emphasized again that um, taking the time to do more project planning in the beginning before getting started, aligning the activities of the project with the specific evidence in the guidelines so that there were clear links between each activity being done and the evidence to support it, delegating more of the work to the committees, um, communicating and consulting more. In our case, 
um, it was with CPSO public health units, but I think that would go for any of the other mentor organizations or those who are working towards their candidacy as well. Um, scheduling regular meetings with the supporting manager to review what's being done and plan for next steps. And a lot of them mentioned that it was helpful to book this time well in advance that the meetings were, were planned um, monthly. Opening uh, the lead champion role to other non-nursing disciplines. Um, and in implementing a better communication staff engagement strategy right from the start. Lead champions were also asked to describe their lessons learned for creating an evidence-based culture. And there was three areas that were the most commonly mentioned as being essential to this. The first was making the evidence meaningful and valuable to staff by focusing on why it's important for them to implement best practice and how it applies to their work. Uh, using active approaches for knowledge transfer, so peer-to-peer -peer models as opposed to only passive approaches like email and newsletters. And they also mentioned the importance of targeting people who you don't have buy-in from and that the hard work doesn't lie with those who are already on board. Having support from management helps them to ensure that staff who are on the BPG committees can, could incorporate that evidence-based practice into their work and monitor their progress. So the next group that we surveyed was the BPG staff champions. So as I mentioned, there were 31 committee members. We had 84% of them participate in the survey, and there was good proportionate representation from, uh, of respondents from each of the BPG committees. So we asked the staff champions to describe the qualities, behaviors, or activities of the lead champion that they worked with that they felt were important in facilitating implementation of the BPG. And there were seven sort of common behaviors or characteristics that were described by respondents, and you can see them listed there on the screen. So respondents emphasized the, import, or the passion, motivation, and commitment of the lead champions. And we heard lots of comments about the champions and their enthusiasm, their positivity and passion about the BPG in the topic area and their investment and persistence in achieving the outcomes of the project. They also described that the lead champions sought input and were open to accepting feedback and encouraging collaboration. Uh, they said that lead champions were organized and demonstrated a great ability to keep the group and the project on task. They noted that the champions communicated well through regular meetings and updates that they gave um, clear and concise directions and developed good timelines and parameters for the project. Um, they said that the lead champions they were working with were very supportive of the BPG champions and sensitive to their individual learning needs. So they really helped all committee members to learn about the BPG at their own learning pace and made sure they understood the concepts and encouraged their participation to make it meaningful for them. They also commented about the knowledge and expertise, which is no surprise about the lead champions with regard to the topic area and the implementation process, um, and also about their willingness to carry out the tasks required to implement the BPG. So it was really great to see that the lead champions were recognized by their peers for the qualities that allowed them to successfully implement those BPGs. We asked the, asked the staff champions or the committee members to describe, in their opinion, how their own involvement impacted implementation of the BPG. And the majority of their comments touched on at least one of the following three themes that you can see on the screen there. Just over a third of respondents felt that they impacted the BPG implementation by transferring knowledge about the BPG and the process back to other staff in the organization. And they did this through things like discussions at team meetings and presentations. They also felt that they brought knowledge and expertise from their program or work area to the committee. And this helped the committee to better envision what the work would look like once they had implemented the BPG. And another good group of them felt that they impacted the BPG implementation by helping to carry out and plan uh, the implementation activities. So, for example, in our organization, there were some staff who helped to pilot a phone survey for client-centered care. They helped with drafting project plans and also with policy development and other activities. 
So as we did with the lead champions, we also asked the staff champions to give us their lessons learned about creating an evidence-based culture. And the most common lesson was related to time and resources. So they learned that creating an evidence-based culture takes a lot of time, resources, and emphasized um, that those things are important to ensure that change is sustainable and that staff are engaged in the process. They also learned that in order to create an evidence-based culture, there's got to be engagement of the stakeholders through collaboration and getting their feedback. And this is especially important for us in our public health unit setting because of the need to understand how to incorporate the BPGs in a way that was meaningful for a variety of disciplines. They also learned that um, information about evidence-based practice needs to be shared with staff and other stakeholders and communicated in a way that's meaningful to them so that they know how to incorporate it into their practice. So one respondent pointed out that when we know we are using evidence-based practice, everyone feels more confident and informed about their practice. I'm going to pass it back over to Sarah now um, to talk about the final group that we interviewed for the project, which was the managers. So again, there were five supporting managers um, who participated in an interview, and um, we had 100% uh, participation from them. And Sarah's going to give you some of the highlights of the facilitators and barriers and the lessons learned from the managers. Great. Great. Thanks, Lindsay. So, one of the main facilitators that the managers mentioned um, that they perceived as a facilitating um, for implementing DTSO was knowing and understanding the initiative in advance. Um, the, some comments that managers made were that hearing the experiences and lessons learned of others who had already been down the road was really helpful. And being familiar with RNAO and having an understanding of what BCGs are made it easier to support the lead champion. As you can see from that statement, some managers had experience with RNAO BPGs prior to embarking on the BTSO journey, um, which um, they identified, obviously, as a facilitator. Um, another facilitator they mentioned was the um, EPG Interdisciplinary Committee. Um, the, the benefit of the committees in helping them to think outside the box um, due to the multidisciplinary aspect of this committee and generate ideas on how to implement the BPG throughout the health unit. So they looked at those BPG committees as supporting for the manager's role. Other helpful support that the managers identified was the lead champion being allocated time for the project. When um, lead BPG staff had time formally dedicated to BPG implementation, parked out in their workload, the momentum of the BPG continuously moved forward. The time allowed the lead to carefully consider the impacts of practice change on staff and mitigate any potential challenges with implementation. Another helpful support that managers mentioned was having um, other staff and experts review the plans and help develop the outcomes, such as the epidemiologist and the program evaluator. Another um, helpful facilitator was um, senior management support, um, such as the chief nursing opportunity. Um, and that was looking at um, opportunities to um, learn about the BPSO journey through different forums such as management meetings, directors forums, and other organizational channels um, like board reports. Um, as with the other groups, managers did identify some barriers to um, the PSO implementation. And one of those obviously was lack of time. And one manager said it was hard because all this stuff was just piled onto everyone's workload. Nothing was taken away. I just didn't have time to engage and support the champion in a way that was needed. Um, another barrier that managers mentioned was the lack of role clarity. And we saw that in the BPG lead champion survey as well, um, that it wasn't always clear what the role of managers were and it wasn't consistent across the five lead managers um, what um, their role should be in BPG implementation. 
Another uh, barrier that um, managers identified was lack of training. Um, so one manager said, in hindsight, if I'd had the time, I would have gone to the summer institute training. It's invaluable, and I think everyone in the project should have the opportunity to participate. But due to one factor or another, she wasn't able to. Um, other challenges um, that managers mentioned were a mismatch between the manager work assignments and the current BPG topic area. So some managers weren't necessarily topic area experts for the BCG, and therefore it may have took them longer to learn about the BCG and understand implementation strategies specific to the BCG. It might be especially challenging in a public health setting where many BCGs are more acute care and long-term care focused, and it would have taken a bit of time to really examine the BCG and make it applicable to public health practice. Um, a final barrier was um, uh, as mentioned with the BPG lead champion, was that the implementation committee at times became a forum for updating and reporting instead of problem solving and decision making. Um, so if more time had been able to be spent at that table on group problem solving, collective learning and sharing experiences, it may have been more helpful in supporting BPG lead champions and implementation committees in um, implementing those BPGs. Managers were also asked what the recommendations would be for another manager taking on the same role in implementing um, BPSO. So some of these um, recommendations are to ensure that the necessary organizational supports for the project are in place. So make sure that everyone um, knows about BPSO and supports the BPSO project. Uh, another recommendation is ensure that you have a passion for the BPG topic area you're supporting. Um, again, that mismatch between topic area and um, BPG implementation may impact on success. Ensure that the lead champion understands the role and the commitment, so what their role is and what the expectations are for implementation. Ensure that the lead champion's workload can be um, redistributed to take on the work for the project. We all know that BPG work and implementation and culture change takes time and effort on behalf of the staff. So um, either incorporating that into their existing workload or carving out time for them to be working on it is it, very helpful to ensure the success. Um, schedule regular meetings with the lead champion is very important to support that lead champion in their role and forming the BCG implementation committee. Managers were asked um, if they would have any recommendations for another organization beginning on the BPSO journey, and these were some of the responses. Um, understand the commitment required to become a BPSO. Um, so it's, it's going into it with eyes open, considering the true resource input, not just the managers and the champions, but all of the staff and the organization involved. And looking at support from senior management, again, for the time and resource commitment for the project. So they know what we're, they're signing on to, and we can make a, a, a knowledgeable and informed decision. Uh, balance workload, so make um, BPSO should be added to the organization strategic plan and annual organization objectives and priorities, not just kind of an add-on or piled on top, but incorporating it into the culture and fabric of the organization. Um, some other recommendations that managers had were plan in advance. Um, come up with your outcomes early so that you know what you'll be measuring both for Enquire indicators and to measure the progress of the BPG implementation, and have some lead time to do forward planning before you jump into the project. Sometimes when we take on projects, we're so excited to get started um, doing activities that we don't always take the time necessary to plan um, the activities out in advance, including evaluation objectives. Uh, another recommendation would be to use your mentor organization. Um, this is a great resource offered by RNAO, and um, we think it's really important to take advantage of this, to talk with somebody else who's gone through similar experiences and learn from their um, journey. 
Other recommendations that managers mentioned that might have been helpful were engaging staff so they understand the benefits of taking on the lead champion role. Again, sometimes we jump into things really quickly and we think it's really important for staff to understand what the commitment would be of being a VPG lead. Set aside time to do a detailed, to complete the detailed reports due to RNAO. Decide on inquire um, indicators as quickly as possible. Um, we think it's important for uh, organizations to conduct an evaluation of the initiative as a whole so that the organization can measure the impacts of the initiative, make informed decisions, and make recommendations for future projects. Um, we think it's uh, important to be prepared for staffing changes because inevitably those will occur throughout the journey. And most importantly, recognize and celebrate the work of champions and the work of the BTSO, um, people who are involved in the BTSO. In celebration of Nursing Week, we applied for an RNAO BTG Open House funding, and we were successful in getting that funding. During that, um, we committed to um, um, continuing the spread of BTGs throughout all nursing sectors. We had 12 nursing sectors represented. Um, and we did a media event highlighting the best practice spotlight organization to coincide with the open house. Um, from that open house event, 61% um, of attendees reported improved understanding of their role as nurses in a changing healthcare system. 74% reported increased awareness of best practices in nursing. And there was a strong interest in RNAO best practice guidelines workshops. Um, over half of the attendees at the open house reported that they had implemented or were in the process of implementing BPGs or evidence-informed practice in their workplace. And there was also interest um, expressed at the open house and which has continued since then in strengthening, strengthening the cross-sector collaboration for BPG implementation. And through that, we have established the Great Bruce Nursing Practice Network that looks at continuing the spread of best practice implementation throughout all healthcare centers. So that um, comes to the conclusion of our formal part of the presentation. We'll now turn it over to Catherine to um, facilitate the questions. So thank you, Sarah and Lindsay, for an excellent presentation. Also, thanks to all the, the managers, the lead champions who participated in the evaluation and their insights that you've captured um, in these evaluation results. So we do want to take some time uh, for some questions now. Um, and a reminder that um, if you're wanting to ask a question to Sarah or Lindsay, please use the chat box using the All Participants option. And then we can um, have some further discussion. Um, maybe I can start things off just with a question about um, advice that you would have for anyone uh, listening today who might be considering evaluation of um, their organization as a BPSO or in implementing guidelines. Um, you indicated that you had a very high response rate from your survey. Um, you talked about doing an, the interviews and that you gave the participants the option to review the transcripts and to delete any comments they didn't want to share, indicating a really high level of trust. So a lot of pieces in this evaluation that I think were done very well. So I'm wondering the lessons learned in completing such uh, an evaluation process and what you might suggest to those listening today. Thanks. Hi, it's Lindsay here. Um, yeah, I think probably the first piece of advice if you're thinking about doing an evaluation of the BPSO initiative as a whole is to start planning for that the minute you get your funding, you know that you're going to be embarking on this journey. So thankfully, um, I wasn't initially involved in the, uh, the original proposal that would have went to RNAO, but in my understanding of that, um, you get a lot of the legwork done by completing that proposal. So, you know, there's a, a project plan that needs to be sent in and a logic model. And so that's sort of the first start first step to getting an evaluation plan started, which is that logic model. So 
what we did is look at our logic model from the original proposal and then developed evaluation questions around each of the outputs and outcomes um, that we had hoped we would achieve um, in going through the BPSO um, process here. So by building those in from the very beginning, we knew exactly what we needed to collect um, throughout to record our outcomes of the initiative as a whole and also had the timelines in mind for when it would be best for conducting those interviews and surveys so that it's not kind of thrown together at the last minute. So that pre-planning is definitely really helpful and I think that's sort of the same approach that groups would take as they're evaluating their individual BPGs as well. So just following a very similar process as you would for, the, for each BPG but for the project um, as a whole. And Catherine, you also mentioned that idea of um, through the interviews and the surveys sort of protecting participants' um, confidentiality um, and giving them the option for anonymity and participating. And that's just, I guess, best practice for evaluation. So um, obviously in the surveys that went out to all staff, they were completely um, anonymous and therefore confidential. So we're always careful when we review that information at the end to strip anything that could be um, potential identifiers for, per for people. And that's common in an organization the size of ours. It's small. Um, and so sometimes due to the nature of people's comments, you can identify who it might be if they're commenting on a particular program area or BPG. So we were always careful to strip off anything that could be identifying and then again giving them the managers and the champions because there was such a small group of them the opportunity to review those comments so there's no surprises when the results come out in the end they sort of know what's going to be said and feel um, a sense of ownership over it too that's great thank you um, I see we have a question from Amanda. Thanks, Amanda. Um, she asks, how will the results from this evaluation inform future planning and work at the organization level, particularly with new and ongoing quality improvement projects? So what are next steps as far as this evaluation? You've got lots of data, lots of information that really can help you in the go forward to build an even stronger BPSO. So how do you use this information? How is it communicated back to all of the participants, back to the organization? So, um, obviously, as I mentioned in answering the last question, all of the participants who um, were involved in the interviews or completing the surveys always have a chance to review that information before it's shared externally with the whole organization. So, we, we did that, and then we also did roll out all of the results to the organization as a whole. So, we have a sort of central um, intranet system here where all of our results are posted. Um, they were also shared back with RNAO, and we do plan to use them as we work as a mentor with other organizations who are going through the BPSO project. So we are acting as a mentor now and for any others who reach out to us um, and obviously sharing it through this, this um, forum right now will hopefully help others incorporate some of our lessons learned as well. Um, and then, of course, as Amanda um, mentioned, a lot of the results from this project are applicable not just in the sense of a BPSO implementation but through our work in quality improvement and accreditation and as we look for um, staff to take on leadership roles in rolling out those um, different initiatives I think there are a lot of lessons learned that we can transfer over um, in that sense to better support staff um, and the managers who work with them and then any any committees they form to roll out that work. Great, thank you. It's uh, a lot of communication back, which I think is so important that uh, when you conduct the evaluation, summarize that data, that that's, that's really only the, the beginning steps. Then it's that communication back and really valuing the input and then acting on that input so that then staff feel that it's been a worthwhile exercise to help measure them. You know, have we done the right things right, as I was saying before? And what are our next steps? Is this really um, benefiting the organization and those that we serve? So thanks for that. Um, Lucia asks, how did you engage the PHIs? What was in it for them? I have always sent information out to everyone, but still have little uptake from this sector. 
Hi, Lucia. I think that this is a, a yeah, we've had some struggles too in engaging these PHIs. I think um, the one um, committee that we really found in OFTHI for our Kate is a public health inspector. Um, one committee that really engaged the PHI is an interdisciplinary committee we developed for client center care. And we took the client, I think it's called something different now, person and family center care. Um, but we took that guideline and um, invited a bunch of different disciplines that work at public health. So as I mentioned, speech and dental and PHIs and, and nurses to come together, review the guideline and say, what does it mean to me in my practice? And we had a really strong PHI at the committee that took um, the um, recommendations from the client center care guidelines to the rest of the PHIs, and they really looked at how they could um, make their practice more client centered, realizing that it's an enforcement and regulatory role, but still looking at um, incorporating the principles of client center care into their work. Thanks for that. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions, so maybe I'll um, have one of my own then. Oh, yeah, this um, one from Michelle, actually. Oh, thank you. Sure. Let me just, I just popped up. Thank you. Yeah. So um, when we did a BPSO initiative, Michelle writes, the hospital was also going through a lot of changes uh, as an organization, and the continuity and value of the BPG was lost. Would you, would, would you suggest for an organization not to take on a BPSO initiative when there are so many changes taking place? Certainly something we talk about at our level one workshop about um, change saturation, that there's only so much change that we can take on at one time. So how would you comment on that for Rochelle's question? Yeah, I think um, Sarah and I are just kind of whispering back and forth to each other here as we think about that. It's a really great question. So. Um, I think, and Sarah mentioned this as she was going through, but being careful about assessing your readiness as an organization um, before you take it on is really important. And I think we are really lucky here in that our um, chief nursing officer, who um, was sort of the one who, I guess, got us kick-started on this whole journey in the first place, um, is also our director of accountability um, and leads both our accreditation um, process and things like strategic planning. And she's really good at linking all of these different initiatives together so that it doesn't feel like we're doing a bunch of additional work in addition to our day-to-day -day work. So she's able to sort of weave them together and present things in a way so that um, people feel that working towards something like the BPSO initiative is also going to help us achieve um, the things that we need to to achieve our accreditation status. And that definitely happened because, for example, one of the things that we're assessed on to become an accredited organization is that we um, implement best practice and we measure and evaluate our change. Um, and I think that we really saw a change in staff in terms of how they deliver their work and measuring the outputs of what they do and the benefit to their practice and to our clients through this BPSO initiative. So that actually gave us the evidence that we're going to need to show to Accreditation Canada when the time comes that this is a normal part of our practice. So I think it's sort of about presenting things in a way that helps people feel like it's not an additional thing added to their workload, that it's a tool to help them um, make their work easier and achieve other outcomes um, while they're doing it. I think you're so right that the importance of aligning the BPG work with other work certainly can make it seem like it's um, less onerous, less of a big change, but rather more aligned with the work that you're currently doing as an add-on to enhance the good work that you're already doing. So thank you for that, Jen. Thanks, Rochelle, for that question. Um, I wondered from your presentation, um, you indicated that um, the manager support was critical, but you also indicated that there are times when we were having those managers present was also intimidating. So mm -hmm. have you made changes in terms of them to go forward? Um, who attends those meetings? At what point do managers participate? And are there other times when it, it's more just the lead champions that are involved? Yeah, 
Yeah. We're just um, referring back and forth here. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry. We're sharing, we're sharing one microphone and headset. So. <laughs> um, yeah, so the role of managers moving forward. It, it, it was a really interesting observation to hear that, um, you know, I remember sitting through those interviews and hearing from the champions about, um, you know, they obviously really felt that, that that larger steering committee was a really valuable part of the project. So it, it wasn't that um, they didn't think that was necessary, but there was obviously something going on. I don't know whether it was just that it was a larger group setting or that there were a lot of other things that needed to be happening at those meetings in terms of getting reports into RNAO that um, just limited the time they had to communicate. But I would say maybe it didn't come across as well in the presentation, but I would say overall the relationship between the lead champions and the managers, at least from my perspective, was excellent. So there was a lot of collaboration and sharing there, and I think openness about the challenges that would, had come up and ways to troubleshoot those. So I think one-on-one -on -one between the, um, the lead champions and the managers, that was excellent. There was a lot of openness there. But it was obviously something about that larger steering committee that um, I guess didn't allow all of them to feel comfortable bringing up some of the barriers that they were encountering. So um, I think as we move forward in implementing BPGs in the future or as we're looking at staff to lead future projects, um, we need to focus on making sure that either we set time on that, maybe just even within the agenda, that this is an opportunity right now for you to share things that aren't working well so that there's that openness that it's okay to talk about those things in those settings, or potentially look at um, a separate, more informal time for the staff to meet. So I think there's some pretty simple solutions there that could be implemented in the future to make sure um, that the staff or the lead champions feel supported in that way. Certainly you're acknowledging there is the reality of um, barriers and facilitators and to put that out there and make it almost a standing item on an agenda so that yeah. we're evaluating that. Yeah, yeah, it's an inevitable part, I think, of any project um, or initiative that we undertake. So it's better to just be open about it and sort of correct things as we go along instead of pretending that they're not there. Sure, and again, you can refer back to your lessons learned from your evaluation and also um, referring back to the toolkit. We talk about facilitators and barriers, and in any change process, there is going to be um, these hiccups as we work together in different um, projects, different collaborations. Yeah, exactly. uh, we have a question from Kate, and she's referring to slide 15. So maybe if you can change back to that slide, if you're able to. Um, she says, I do not currently work in Ontario, but will soon be moving um, so I can familiarize myself with RNAO's BPGs and implementation. Um, she's wondering um, if you can speak to the active approaches like peer-to-peer -peer transfer. Maybe expand for me on what those strategies were, and she's referring to slide 15. So maybe if we want to go back to slide 15. Thanks, um, Kate, for the um, question. So I think that um, at the beginning of our journey, we created a newsletter and we called it the A Scoop, thinking that everybody would be real. No, we called it the B Scoop. Sorry for BPSO, thinking that everybody would be so excited to read it and they would keep <laughs> informed about what's going on. And it was a lesson learned that perhaps sometimes um, engaging um, groups um, in existing meetings where they're, where they're already talking, so looking at nursing team meetings or looking at uh, meetings where uh, teams are already together, um, how, uh, is more of a forum for uh, disseminating information than a blanket newsletter that is um, distributed um, via our own internal um, uh, technology. So looking at more of that active approach, so going to team meetings, meeting one-on-one -on -one with people, developing lunch and learns, having uh, BPSO celebrations where everybody can come together and learn. Um, we found that that perhaps was a lot more effective in 
in creating the support needed for implementing practice change than simply a newsletter. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks for that. And yes, Katie's saying yes, and thank you for that. And again, just looking at this slide, um, the importance of, of really letting staff know why it is that uh, you're starting on this journey, making this change of implementing best practice, and that cannot be overstated and really over um, emphasized enough as you begin this process. But as you've identified, there's so much, so much to do in, in a launch that sometimes that gets missed or we well, just assume that everyone is on board and, and don't always just fully address all those questions and concerns that may be, may be out there. So. And I'm just looking to see if we have any other questions, otherwise we're almost out of time. I'll just give you another sec to ask any other questions. In terms of the questions that you developed for the evaluation, where did those come from? Did you use other sources? Sorry, Catherine, would you remind repeating that, or you were just passing the headset? No, 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 no. I was wondering just in terms of the questions that you developed for your survey, for your uh, interviews, where you came up with those questions, were there other sources that you used to best use the time of your um, energy of your staff? Yeah, so, um, like I said, when we submitted the proposal to RNA originally, um, there was a logic model that had been developed that focused on the outcomes that we hoped to achieve as an organization by taking on the initiative as, as a whole. So, I mean, obviously there was the outcomes that would come from each of the BPGs, but as a whole, what did the organization hope to accomplish? And a lot of that was around establishing that culture of evidence-informed practice in the organization. And there were also some outcomes that we were hopeful for for the individuals or the staff who participated. So we wanted, we hoped that it would help them develop their leadership skills um, and their competence in um, uh, implementing change and evaluating it and that kind of thing. So that made it pretty straightforward in terms of developing the questions because the question then just became, have we achieved um, the outcomes that we hoped to as a result of um, implementing this BPSO initiative? So uh, we were pretty straightforward, actually, in a lot of the questions. It was something like, you know, as part of this project, we hope that uh, we hoped that your skills as a leader would develop. And so I looked a little bit to the literature in terms of how to assess. Um, uh, how, how individuals can self-assess their own leadership skills. So we asked them very just simply something like, before starting on the project, did you perceive yourself to be a leader in this organization? And give them the opportunity to rank the extent to which they felt they were a leader. And then we asked them now, reflecting on the project, um, now that it's finished, where on this scale do you perceive yourself to be a leader now? So. Um, that's sort of just one way to assess that indicator. There's lots of different ways to do it, but um, we did just ask um, the champions to self-assess themselves, and then we also used the, um, the staff champions who participated in the committee. If you remember, we asked them to identify any behaviors or characteristics um, that they observed in the champions. Um, and it was really interesting to see how those behaviors and characteristics aligned really well. And I can't remember the specific reference right now, but there was some great literature from RNAO that had already been published. Yeah, about the transformational, yes, there I've got transformational um, leadership characteristics. And so I was really excited as I was reviewing the information that came from the staff champions to see how well it aligned with those transformational leadership characteristics. So that was really positive. So there's, I would say you want to use your original sort of program or initiative plan and logic model, but then also look to the literature to see what it's saying about how we best measure things like developing leadership capacity. Thank you. It sounds like it really was an outgrowth of, of the whole BPSO journey um, and was used in a way that was very effective for all involved. So thank you for that and thank you for sharing your lessons learned 
Um, it is uh, very much a, a process that is learned by doing, and um, uh, you've got some wonderful examples of how you develop that evaluation. So our time is now up. It is 1 o'clock, so I want to thank everyone for participating and attending in the webinar, and thanks again to Sarah and to Lindsay for their presentation. Um, all of you who have attended, you will be receiving a link to an online survey to evaluate today's presentation. We do appreciate your feedback, um, as well as any suggestions you have for any future knowledge exchange topics. Uh, these webinars are meant for our champions, so please, if there's other topics that you'd like us to, um, to have presented, then let us know. Um, once you've completed the evaluation, you will receive a certificate of attendance. A reminder, too, that we do currently have a, a request for a proposal for application for host sites for our 2016-17 fiscal year for our best practice champions workshops. Um, we will, in, in addition to the evaluation, we will send you the link for that as well. So um, we um, do, again, thank you for attending today. Thanks again to Lindsay and to Sarah for their insights. And we wish you a good afternoon. Thanks.